I'm Mark Major. I'm the Associate Director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. I'm with Charlie Savage. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the Washington correspondent for the New York Times. Welcome to Penn State. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So uh, could you tell us briefly about um, what you're going to be talking about today? Yes. Uh, so I was asked to talk about uh, the promise and perils of president covering presidential power. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how important it is right now and in the last decade to be an investigative or to have a robust investigative journalism trying to bring to public light and public understanding uh, national security legal policies that this administration and the Bush administration before it have crafted in response to the continuing crisis caused by the 9-11 attacks and then the wars that have spun off of it. Uh, so there's so much of uh, important policies have been developed behind closed doors, whether we're talking about torture and interrogation, uh, you know, tr treating terrorists differently when it comes to prosecution, uh, interpreting war powers broadly or narrowly as far as bringing, you know, starting an attack on a different group in a different country as we see just right now with the attacks in Syria mm -hmm. uh, on ISIS and some other group that we hadn't heard of before, all under the banner of the group that supposedly attacked us on 9-11. These policies uh, have tremendous consequences for the state of uh, the future of the United States and the state of our uh, continuing experiment in self-government in terms of democratic accountability. The public has to understand what's being done so that when it casts its votes election time, it can either accept and legitimate or reject and change those policies. But a huge amount of them have been crafted uh, institutionally in secret and that requires investigative journalism and right at this moment where this is becoming more crucial than it's been maybe in generations we're also experiencing uh, an unprecedented crackdown on leaking on the unauthorized disclosure of classified information for public consumption to reporters under Obama there have been eight to date uh, leak related criminal prosecutions that's compared to three from all presidents starting with George Washington through George W. Bush. Mm. So in, under just one president, we've had eight leak investigations to date. It's totally transforming the relationship between confidential sources, potential confidential sources, and reporters. It's making it much higher risk uh, to talk to reporters, even for, about innocuous but classified information, and topics surrounding things, like what is it, what is it that's happening right now in Syria or Libya or these places. And so the stakes are getting higher at the very moment in which it's becoming harder because of this change. And so I'm going to talk about how these two things fit together. I'm going to tell some stories about the difficulties and yet the importance of covering uh, presidential power in this era and reflect a little bit about what the implications of this crackdown will be for the future of um, the press's ability to help provide democratic accountability. So you mentioned the Bush administration and in your award-winning book, uh, Takeover, um, it was a uh, examination and critique of their robust exercise of executive power. If you were to write that book right now, um, what type of continuities would you draw and contrast between the Bush administration and the current administration? So there's been a lot of discussion over the last, of, well, since Obama came into office, since 2009 and 2010, about the surprising degree of continuity that his national security policies have had with those he inherited from the second term of the Bush administration. Uh, with the notable exception of torture, he has continued a lot of what he inherited, whether it's the use of military commissions, he's still holding people at Guantanamo and without trial, he's using, he ramped up the use of drones to you know, target people for killing away from conventional battlefields. Obviously, as the Snowden leaks revealed, he was presiding over if anything, a more robust national security surveillance state. Uh, and people, and so it's been this very puzzling thing because when Obama ran in 2007, 2008, it was going to be hope and change, and he was the constitutional law professor, and Bush was ab abusing the law, and it was going to be a new direction. And so people have been wondering, you know, where did this come from? How did this happen? And I think there's a couple of ways to think about that. But one is that when you say that Obama is acting like Bush, you have to define what it means to act like Bush. So one answer to that might be having these policies which seem to be uh, you know, subject to criticism on civil liberties grounds. But there's a whole different level of what made Bush controversial, which was he was very often putting in place these policies unilaterally in defiance of statutes that said he couldn't do those things, or treaties that said he couldn't do those things. And Bush was invoking a very broad theory of his power as commander-in-chief to 
basically put in place policies that he thought were necessary for national security above any kind of legal constraint. Obama and the former Clinton, now Obama administration, Democratic legal establishment strongly rejected that view of uh, a president's power to get around statutory constraints. And so they have tried very hard to cabin what they're doing with claims, sometimes increasingly stretched claims, that what they're doing is authorized by statute, not uh, a, be a statute being overridden by there are some constitutional claim. So this, they have this sort of rule of law critique of Bush, which exists separately from the civil liberties constraint. And the, the rule of law critique of what Bush was doing got intertangled with the civil liberties critique in a way that was harder to understand at the time, but now we can see that they need to be disaggregated. So in this way, Obama's acting like Bush, but in this way, he's not. And one of the ways, uh, sort of the insights, is that what Bush was doing became normalized over time because Congress, things that he put in place unilaterally, Congress eventually reacted to and uh, adjusted federal law to authorize what he was doing with laws like the Military Commissions Act, which mm -hmm. authorized military tribunals, or the FISA Amendments Act, which authorized warrantless surveillance. So when Obama comes in and he inherits this, the rule of law problem is gone. There's still the civil liberties problem. And what he says, and his sort of legal philosophy is, the rule of law problem was what it meant to act like Bush. I'm not doing that. And these other policies with congressional authorization are in fact necessary to fight the war against al-Qaeda within a framework of law. It's the confusion between these two different uh, planes has been one source of people's misunderstanding or befuddlement at the fact that Obama has had so much continuity. That said, I'll just as, add as a coda, over time, as Bush has faded as the foil and the Tea Party Republican Congress has arisen as the foil, I think it's uh, self-evident that Obama has gotten much more willing to invoke unilateral executive powers to make robust use of muscular executive powers, more probably in the domestic policy sphere like immigration law and, and you know, adjusting how he's enforcing the health care law than in matters like torture and military commissions. Uh, but it's clear that his philosophy of what it means to be president in, in, in the constitutional order is shifting under the pressures of current political dynamics. Okay. Charlie Savage of the New York Times, thank you very much. Thank you very much.